at the uh, May 11, 2022, at a project uh, jazz club. you guys oh, so lovely what a gift mm, thank you eric thank you steve Thanks, that was eric. beautiful <laughs> that was awesome Love it. well welcome very very cool We've got elizabeth connecting just wait for her to come in Hi, Elizabeth. Welcome. Thanks for coming in today. Glad to be with you. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for being here. I um, thought I would open um, as we start weaving together different questions and threads and stories. Uh, Wendy Elford was advocating last week that we all kind of come into each meeting with some kind of story. And then as a result of our time being together, we're transformed in some way and we leave with a story. And so I um, want to just invite uh, a little moment to reflect on what story you're coming into today with. Just kind of make that conscious. Um, what, what story are you individually bringing into today? How do you perceive that connects up to the larger meta story that we're all here in service of? As we think about that story, I um, want to also weave in um, a thread that came up in our last meeting from Helene Lindmark, who's on the phone from northern Sweden. She asked what I thought was a, uh, was a really interesting question that, that sparked a little dialogue, which was, what is it to be grounded and act from your own unique temple? And I'm going to honor how Helene needs, likes to ask questions by not, not inviting any uh, public response, but just as a, as a question that's a gift to you. What does it mean to be grounded and to act from your own unique temple? I was with, a, um, I was with one of our Jedi friends uh, the other day doing some Zen archery. And he asked me an interesting question, which was, uh, whether I thought much about what the word temple means. And we were reflecting in, in the last meeting uh, as I was sitting there doing some archery and thinking about his question, uh, it dawned on me that, that the word temple is kind of like tempo, it's kind of like time. Uh, so it was appropriate that we started this session with some music. Hmm. And so his description with, with a temp, of a temple was that it was a place related to time, specifically a place to wait. And so then we were, we were asking the question, well, what does it mean to go to a temple or a place where you're waiting? Like, what are we waiting for? So that's maybe another question is like, what's, uh, if we're waiting, what are we waiting for? And 
he was proposing the answer is something like a, a temple is somewhere you go to wait as long as you need to, to emerge transformed or being whatever it is that you think you need to be to move forward. He also, he also brought in that, uh, that in a temple as we wait, we maybe wait patiently and patiently has roots back to um, like almost a connotation of suffering. And so it's kind of interesting that sometimes as we wait, we're experiencing hardship, we're experiencing pressures, we're experiencing trials, we're suffering to some extent, but that time and that suffering is transforming us maybe into who it is that we need to become. And I, I had another conversation with Helene this, this week, and we were talking about how so many of us have wandered off the path so many times in our lives. And those things are painful. Those things have brought suffering. Those things are embarrassing. But they're also inform who we are today. And none of us would be who we are today had we not gone through those experiences. Um, and so just wanted to invite, invite some of that into the room. Uh, so thank you for being here. Um, before we get into action, um, there's been this amazing theme emerging. Um, so, so week one was kind of aligning around our highest shared intention. Week two was an effort to map and analyze a little bit of where we are at, what, what are the pieces in the room. Week three, we were talking about engaging what might be missing if we're going to advance. We got into week four planning uh, I did my best to synthesize a little, some of that and present it back to the group. And now we're getting into action and considering what it would mean to take the energy and work and value that we've created and carry that forward beyond this six week cycle into a long term project. And there's been um, Kilu, Wendy, Sophia, many others have been bringing to the forefront this um, tension that. Kilu's describing that she feels as a tension between kind of the masculine and the feminine, um, between the desire to be and act and do and get into motion and the immense like spaciousness that's required for the emergence of things that are, are fragile or are subtle or need to be paid attention to and noticed and brought forth to awareness and cultivated And so I'm feeling the reason I brought up this notion of temple and what it means to be grounded in our unique temples and our collective temple and this grounded in enough spaciousness to accomplish both the doing and be totally present and aware to the fragile emerging green shoots of life and possibility that need to be present is, is an amazing tension. And, um, so I just wanted to bring that tension kind of consciously into the room uh, before we, we kind of start talking a little bit about action so that we invite both those. Um, and Sophia, I'm not sure if you're listening, but I also uh, um, just wanted to celebrate uh, the green shoot of life that you brought forward as a proposal <laughs> this week. Um, and then acknowledge the way that uh, kind of the focus on structure and doing um, that I think I, I brought into the room, like the preconception or the focus on structure, it, it like almost stepped on and squashed that green shoot in a, in a really interesting way that I think I learned a lot from. So I just wanted to thank you for uh, helping me learn that and, and acknowledge that. Um, and so I think we're learning a lot about like this process of emergence and how we all need to be in that. And I wanna be, I guess, careful in our conversation today not to transition too quickly into program management and doing mode so that we miss um, maybe the wiser, subtler things that need to come forward and be acted on. So that's my, uh, my brief reflection on some of the things that have been, been coming forward. And concurrent with that, I think 
there's a big opportunity to switch. Sophia um, kind of observed, okay, we were invited to a six week, I think at one point I called it a sprint, maybe a cycle, but the basic intention was, okay, let's get some people into the room that are anchors of all these different networks and projects and things. And let's see if there's something that can emerge together that's more powerful than any of us can do in isolation. And sprint carries the connotation of a certain structure and action and kind of getting into movement. Um, and so uh, Pete also wisely uh, said, hey, maybe you shouldn't use the word sprint because we're kind of using that pretty loosely. Maybe it's more something like a cycle. So I've tried to adjust that language. Um, but I think there's, um, there's kind of a shift I think we're considering this week as we consider acting upon everything that we've articulated the last four weeks, which is this shift to, um, I'll follow what Wendy's saying right now, this shift to holding a brave space, a nurturing space, a longer term space, an accepting space, a space of building together over the long run, space of vulnerability, space of making mistakes, um, a space of being that's matched to the doing. And so um, I just want to uh, express such gratitude for so much sensitivity and wisdom in the room that's bringing all these themes um, together and so let's keep navigating. It's probably right on the edge of that. So I have a suggestion for our meeting today. It might not be a good suggestion today, um, but I was going to suggest that we spend um, maybe like seven minutes in breakout rooms, uh, uh, being together, being human together, saying hello, and that we come back and then do a uh, use the fishbowl style dialogue um, with three or four people at a time in that Sophia has been introducing to us um, specifically to specifically to discuss um, for anybody that's looked at it kind of the proposed plan of action that I put out and to just have some vulnerable close unfolding dialogue on that um, so that hopefully we emerge from this call with a with a wiser plan than we came into it with and then I'll um, do my best to take that dialogue plus the feedback I get via email update that document and then try to mirror um, something that's that's better and more likely to succeed back to the back to the group so how does that feel to everybody does that feel like a a good use of our time today and does anybody okay any thumbs down or people who object okay beautiful so i'm gonna um i'm gonna split into breakout rooms of approximately four-ish people. Um, we'll take maybe about seven minutes. Um, if you just wanna be human together, go in any direction you want. If there's any groups that enjoy having prompts, uh, the prompt that I would invite is, what's, a, what's like a big right question that has been weighing on you or coming through that you think we should be asking ourselves. Um, so feel free just to chat, be human. Um, uh, we could, you know, if you're in Judy's group, make sure you celebrate the engagement of her daughter. Um, and if you need a, need a prompt, um, what's a big right question that's been coming through for you? Okay, so I'm gonna form these breakout groups. create five, four to five participants per room. Actually, I'm gonna create six. So it's three to four. All right, have fun. We'll see you in about seven minutes. Hey, Kilo. Hello. How are you? Good, good. You're welcome to go to the breakout room or stay here and hang out with me if you want. I don't know how I get to the breakout room. I was surfing the chat. Oh, there we go. No, oh, just stay. Up. Yeah, or stay here with me if you want.
rooms. I accidentally left my breakout room. <laughs> Hello, brother. Hey, I think it's um, I think it's time for us to start a little uh, brand marketing comms uh, pod. You've been advocating that Hello for a while. Uh, yeah. Do Do you want to anchor that together somehow? Sure, sure. Uh, you were mentioning um, um, I'm blanking on her name for a moment from uh, at the impact um, the open. Uh, oh, uh, Katie Archambault from yeah, Open Future yeah. Coalition. Yeah, yeah. As somebody you've been talking to too, and I have deep respect for her too. So I don't know. Yeah, if she's, yeah. yeah. She's a star. We need to get her some funding. She's like in full court, like trying to get runway mode. Um, mm -hmm. And so if we can, but yeah, we'll we'll discuss that. Okay, sounds good. <clears throat> Hello, welcome back. <laughs> Sorry, we, we took 10 minutes because we were having such a beautiful conversation, such a beautiful conversation. Um, so before we get get into action, um, does anybody have any anything that really struck them or emerged in that conversation you'd like to share? Yes. <laughs> What I was talking with Paul and Michael about is is money and how to be with money. Um, I was saying like we, what was the easiest way to create an issue between you and someone who's close to you, is oh lend them your money. <laughs> it's like there's so many issues we have with money, and I I loved also there the focus on the our emotional charges with that and being aware of that and being with that during what we do and it's not just something like it's not like a project-based thing we do it's just having a shared understanding that that's it's huge and it's good to focus on that how do we deal with money fairly and balanced and ethical and that it serves people's needs all those questions that's beautiful yeah thanks eric I'll, i will just say that that's that's one of my greatest fears that if we bring money into this experiment, it'll blow it up. <laughs> um, and so it's really difficult because we we're in a society where we all need that. And um, in order for this to be sustainable long-term, we need to be able to provision ourselves in the old world, even as we create something better, hopefully. Um, but yeah, such a key point, Eric. We talked in our group about being free to agree and sharing that shared vision of things, but also the importance of being free to raise questions or to disagree without it being controversially shut down, but open to hearing what the concerns of the participants are about what's going on in order that we can address them in a shared way. Yes. Our group talked about the friction between me and we, and the idea of sitting here in a group, being impatient, wanting things to happen, like you're saying, Jordan, uh, let's take stock before we take action. And that implies wading through all the taking stock and listening to idiots like me waste everybody's time. So it, it, the transition from I to we is, well, it's a heck of a journey all on its own. Brother Jonathan, I just want to invite you to um, eliminate an idiot like me from your language. You, you're one of the more exceptional human beings that I met. And um, from our brief interactions, I, I love you and I appreciate you. Um, and you're one of the most insightful people that I've come across. Uh, so oh. I just, I'd invite you to recognize that in yourself. I'm, I'm crying, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. It means a lot. Mary Ann or Elizabeth, would you like to share what our discussion was? You can go ahead. <laughs> um, Sophia. <laughs> Sophia, do you want to do it? 
Okay, all right. So um, we had a, a number of uh, interesting points of intersection. Uh, one of them was those, just the import of the um, integration of indigenous wisdom in this quest. And uh, I think Marianne, you said it pretty well and I'm gonna turn it back to you. I think you were talking about how we really could can that this that that really allows for shooting up very quickly. There's a lot of terrain that is, um, you know, the winding and weaving, if you will. And I'm not using your language, so I apologize. But what I got from that is that there's a lot of eddies we could go into, but actually, the indigenous wisdom can really help us shoot up much quicker. Yeah, I was using the analogy of the game of snakes and ladders. <laughs> Instead of going through the long route, we can just take the ladder straight up and get a lot of work done fast if we just bring them in. They have a lot of wisdom to take us where we want. Another theme that kind of uh, aligns with what Eric was saying previously, and it, we touched on it at the end, I just happened to have come right from a meeting, um, very tech-oriented, Singularity University, and um, one of the people, one of the panelists was talking about, you know, the sort of the game A, the extraction, and that that he's really working mm -hmm. to try and help break himself out of that jail, um, but also younger people. And there was this discussion around, you know, just the wicked problem of, you know, people becoming indentured and, and indebted. And so debt came up another way in this conversation. And then that, that lack of ability to free um, you know, that person to do the, to do the work and to really be in the plan B or the new world order, um, you know, that the shackles of just even things like getting your education, right? You know, people leaving school with debts of, you know, quarter million dollars will, you know, limits what they can do. They have to, you know, kind of play in the extractive game. And so it, 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 it just interesting that that has come up now three times in discussions today in different ways. So just speaking that into the field. We are gonna be delighted to hear what came up in our small group, Elizabeth. George, Lure. please speak to that, the, uh, the, the Jubilee and our conversation perhaps. Yeah, our, our conversation um, also went through um, starting from a basis of love or compassion and how we use that as a basis to form everything. That evolved into the ideas of forgiveness and um, all the different levels of that. And we introduced the idea of, uh, in the old Jewish tradition, there's this idea of Jubilee that's, that's a reset like every seven years, right? Kind of a total social economic reset. And then every series of seven years, you know, every 49 years, please forgive me for my dear Jewish friends, so I'm getting this wrong. Um, but every seven cycles of seven years, right, every 49, 50 years, there's like the meta reset. And so one of the deep questions we asked was what happens if you go a couple thousand years without a jubilee? So this is one of the really critical issues as we, as we start up our uh, you know, groups with our friends in Africa and elsewhere, South America, developing nations, especially there's been so much predatory, predatory debt imposed upon the future generations of the developing world by those who had the resources at the time to meet essential things. And that, that debt, you know, both at the individual level from education, like you spoke to Elizabeth, as well as at the collective level of entire nations of people who made no agreement to sell their children to this future, right? But now have, you know, whatever ports and roadways. I was in, in one of my last trips to, uh, to Kenya, we were driving on this unbelievably improved super highway um, down to Maasai land that was, was built as part of the Chinese kind of uh, modern built and suspenders program. And as I've, as I've traveled and looked at all this infrastructure, it's just like, man, this is, it's like nice to not bounce through the dirt roads and at what price to like mm -hmm. generations of children who, so 
yeah, that that's really interesting. That that has been such a big topic today. So thank you for it's interesting that came through all these groups. Really important topic. So big and expansive. You were talking about being and doing and then the expansiveness. This just like set a whole different frequency into this call. So it's really beautiful that you began here, team. The last thing I would also just add really quickly was in our group, we had talked about uh, younger people as part of the meta project in some way, shape and form. Like even teens to, um, you know, twenties. And that Elizabeth asked a beautiful question that she and Kilu in a group had asked, which was if you were an elder here on earth, what would you want to happen in the next generation or in the next cycle? Which I thought was really beautiful. So the inclusion of this expansiveness and this concept of how the old model, how the mini project was built on debt and enslavement and exclusion is a really fascinating exploration. Anybody in the group that doesn't know, Steve uh, is a wonderful friend who's feeling really called to uh, especially reach out to, uh, to young men with this new paradigm. And in many, many, many of the prophecies from multiple traditions that I've heard about when things change for the better, there's this idea of the great returning of the hearts of the young to the hearts of the old. And that's, that happens at, at a, at a certain thing, but, but encompassed of that is almost like the, the same concept temporarily of the, the hearts of the present culture returning and remembering the hearts of the ancient culture and traditions and festivals. And so, and all those things, right. It's like a part of all these different um, prophetic traditions. So that's a really interesting idea of like, how, how do we remember these ancient patterns and festivals and rituals? And it's, it's interesting when you look back in history, you go like, well, why, why is it that once or twice a month, there's these patterns and feasts and traditions and rituals in any culture that's lasted for thousands of years that, you know, my upbringing in the U.S. is like completely divorced. Thanksgiving once a, once a month. It's like, no, Thanksgiving is maybe every three weeks, every four weeks, like something like that, right? So that's a really interesting thing. And then the marrying up of the strength of the youth and the wisdom of the old, um, also bringing back to this concept of indigenous leadership, maybe and the, the technological and the meeting of all those different, those different forces. So amazing. Beautiful bird call and the perfect timing. It was like a movie sound, you know, script. Bucky Fuller said that um, our children are our elders in universe time. And I think that's a really beautiful echoing of what you were just speaking of, Jordan. When they're not our elders, they hate it. <laughs> really powerful. One of, the, one of the things that my, uh, my father did well was when I was about 12, he said, you know, you're, you're doing a reasonably good job. You know, you're making responsible decisions. I'm going to go ahead and change my relationship to you uh, to be a friend. And as long as you continue acting as a man, we can keep that, you know. Uh, but it, it, I think there's a really interesting way that, so I appreciate that we can invite that you know, the wisdom of the young. And, and then there's this interesting idea of like returning to the state of the uncarved block or the return to childlike faith or whatever, whatever tradition you might identify with. But this idea of that return and, and one of the ways we encounter that is by encountering the, the purity of the youth. And I think we can all benefit from that who are somewhere in the dark. Also, our culture has suppress the idea that fun is useful kids kids are naturally inclined to just go have fun and research indicates that while they're having fun they're learning most of what they need to learn in order to be a human being 
Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That aspect of play, fun. Okay, wonderful. So we're exactly 45 minutes in, which means we're exactly halfway through our scheduled time. Um, and it's amazing that this, this space of spaciousness and being um, that would have been completely forgotten and missed and not noticed had we gone right into action planning um, emerged. So thank you. Before we, before we transition into some dialogue on proposed plans of action, um, is there anybody else who has anything pressing on their heart, soul, mind, spirit that you'd like to share before we transition a little bit? Okay, beautiful. All right, well, it might be that um, if we can live right on this, this balance, like right on the edge of being and doing somehow, in, in a broad and diverse enough community, we might find the, find the magic a little bit. So let's now, let's now shift to, um, I was really reluctant uh, to send out what I sent out. I, um, I actually waited until I was on a phone call with Pete and Sophia and Wendy and some others to, uh, to hit send because <laughs> I just told them I was afraid to do it. And so thank you for the, uh, uh, being there with me. Um, so it's it's difficult to reduce to words like you have these this magical uh, dialogue community being together, and um, some of us are sensing that we're at a really critical moment in history uh, that there might be some urgency that there might be some trials that lie ahead that there might be some challenges and that it might be really really smart to get ourselves organized and into some action um, to create as much distributed well-being, community resiliency, goodness as possible. Um, and so I believe that starts with us figuring out how to organize ourselves increasingly well and walk this balance of being and doing. Um, so I sent out a proposed plan of action that's just a starting point for evolution. Welcome conversation on that. Recognize that it was a tremendously, it was like a lot, um, a heavy lift. So I imagine that many people haven't read it. Um, and so I'll just kind of briefly um, state here in three minutes uh, what the context was of that and then invite a little dialogue. So um, what, I, what I sense might be important for us to do as we move forward through these cycles is to have a regular system of navigation. And as a starting point, we took a, a quarterly cycle and we subdivided it into half and do about a six week cycle because it felt like a quarterly cycle was gonna pulse a little bit too slowly. And so the idea is that every six weeks, we might wanna be doing this combination of doing and being and sensing what's trying to emerge, but then also getting that into written plans of action that we can enact together over the next cycle to advance towards the next milestone that marks the way towards the goal. Uh, and so based on the feedback that we got from the group, uh, there was a couple of adjustments. One is that we got into kind of program management and planning and action much slower than I thought we would, because there was uh, numerous people here advocating for more space for the emergence and being, and, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, and then as we got towards the end of the cycle, there was a sense that maybe the most important thing we could focus on doing was the organization of ourselves across these different networks, organizations, nodes, hubs, existing fields of trust that we're all part of that have already been, been formed. It's like, how do we start to create a, a space of cohesion? So the proposed next step was basically to, in this next six week cycle that would end, uh, would start May 22nd and would end June, July, or sorry, July 2nd, um, to really work on those issues of federating and, and how to create the basic templates and agreements and right relationship among all the different organizations and circles, sovereigns, pods, whatever you want to call them, that might desire to move together. And so basically the, uh, the proposal is that we, we look at establishing that kind of um, federation or place that's outside of the existing 
political parties or religious denominations or organizations maybe we might belong to where we can all come together to work on the one thing that unites us all. Uh, in, in concert with that, uh, there was a proposal that if that's gonna succeed, we need to get kind of a, it seems like for any little thing to succeed, you need a, you need a core team of five or six people that's passionate about it, focused on it and, and advancing it. And so I'm advocating that we attempt to get that small core team built. Uh, the function of that core team would be to continue to coordinate and advance the shared infrastructure that empowers the whole distributed network of individual sovereign projects, initiatives, et cetera, that would be uh, self-organized by a growing community. Uh, that growing community would in turn lead to all the different marketplaces, matchmaking, you know, matching up with needs, resources, et cetera, that are required um, and bring, bring visibility to all that. And so that, that's kind of the sense is that um, what we might want to do next is go from the, you know, we've had, um, I don't know what it is, maybe 20 or 30 people engaged in the asynchronous chat on uh, Mattermost. We've had, you know, 20 or 30 people engaged in, in these weekly meetings. We've got 50 or, 60, 50 or 60 people kind of following along on the email lists and, and ready to move that we just basically focus on bringing that all to a little bit of a, an order where we have a longer term um, thing that would then enable us to really start listening to each individual, each sovereign, each pod about what their needs and offers were essentially, and what we can all do together to make sure that that total nested set of initiatives uh, succeeds to the fullness of its potential. Um, so, th so that's kind of a, a rough summary of 40 pages of thought. Um, and, and again, I apologize for the, for the length of that. Just trying to walk the balance of getting out enough, enough structure without overwhelming. So, um, so let's start a little fishbowl. Um, so this fishbowl thing's been kind of working well. Um, it's been a process of everybody uh, turning off their cameras other than three or four people in the center. And those people essentially just having a focused dialogue with each other. And then whoever wants to um, come into the circle, just turn on your camera. We'll have somebody drop out because uh, because time's a little bit short. I, I might remain in for some of the time uh, with three other people. So how about we have, um, yeah, just just leave your leave your camera on if you would like to be in the opening group. Okay, perfect. Okay, everybody stop. Okay, so we got Pete, Wendy. Judy and Jordan, beautiful. Helene's in. So yeah, go, go ahead and remain in. Okay, beautiful. So we got Helene, Pete and Judy. So let's, and Wendy, that's fine. Wendy, come on in. Sorry about that. No, it's perfect. All right, so, so let's, uh, let's dialogue a little bit about, um, about what's next, um, the, the plan that went out what we could do to improve or make that wiser. And then um, anybody that would like to come into the conversation, just turn your camera on and we'll have somebody drop out. So Pete. Um, uh, yeah, Jordan, I have a, a, a quick observation. Yeah. Uh, you described it being, your, being Jordan <laughs> uh, and being where you are in the organization, you described it in a way that makes sense to you that there's a, an umbrella kind of of you know and a, a a core group and an umbrella of folks working in service of the the greater good the, the highest good um i i would suggest that for most of us it's probably easier to look the other way around so when i'm working on when i'm working when i'm helping the meta project uh, and maybe separately from the core group that's an, an interesting and special thing that probably most people aren't going to be part of the core group. Um, when I'm working on meta project things, I'm working for myself and the people who are working with me and our concerns. And to the extent that that connects with what the meta project is trying to do, that's good. 
and and I can say that you know I'm working with a meta project or I'm working for the meta project is maybe a way to say it. it it's confusing when you say it that way because I'm, I'm not you know an employee of the meta project. Um, but really, I'm working for myself as a sovereign or uh, you know as as a sovereign individual or a sovereign group of of small group of people. And so when I'm called to do something to make the world a better place. I'm doing it for the sovereign, not for the meta group or meta project. Um, so I, I wonder if that that would help people. So then there, you yes. know, there's ways that I project manage what I'm doing, which is different than the, the way other people project manage what they're doing. But yeah, so so to yeah, so thank you for thank you for bringing the those those perspectives right we can look at things from from both sides and i think it's really important to do so so uh, so pete and i are in agreement that it basically starts with it's like if what what we're doing right now isn't really working i think the first thing that we need to do is step back pete i should be talking to you not i'm, I'm going to get better at this fishbowl thing so pete um thank you for that observation so i agree i think i think for for the vast majority of people the most helpful way is to go okay I'm a sovereign individual and I have some skills, gifts, talents, or things I would like to give in, to the world and things that I need from the world in order to survive. And, and then based on the, that uniqueness of being, I might self-organize with a few other people to accomplish a function, right? A circle. So Pete, for instance, uh, this week, you said you're kind of feeling called to maybe convene a group of people focused on uh, get how you what words you use but mapping harvesting composting etc and and so that few people that few group of a few sovereigns that would anchor that then becomes its own little pod or sovereign which is not in any way subordinate to anything it's a voluntary association of sovereigns that are saying hey here's here's a superpower we'd like to offer so then i think that's that's the correct pattern and then from the other way if we're in a core team you and i because you're in both places, right? We might say, hey, we're doing these meetings. It'd be really valuable if there was a group out there that would be willing to kind of make sense of them and mirror that back to the group. And then you might switch on your other hat and go, okay, hey, some people and I might be willing to do that, right? So, so I think that's, that's really important to, um, to do. Okay, so, so Eric said, um, sovereign's an abstract comment concept and requires a bit of time to digest. Um, so Pete, uh, uh, go I, ahead, go ahead, Judy, and then, and then I was just going to offer that, that from my perspective, I think in terms of what can I offer to the topic at hand, and what do I see as questions or potential barriers, and it's a blend of the two. So I would think that in a group or entity of whatever size, start first with what are our talents that we can contribute to a larger whole and what questions might we have, but also where would we start? Because it's much easier to start locally and once you have something, expand it to the next level or share it with other people or communicate that this worked for us, maybe it would work for you. And so it's a, it's a bit of a nucleation, a multiple nucleation process to use a yeah. scientific term. Um, but I wonder if that's a helpful way for us to consider it because each collective group of people, how, however many they are, whether it's two or six or eight or some number, they have to form as a group, we have to form as a group first and say, who are we and what are our talents and what can they be applied to do? So, so to illuminate this, uh, to build on what Judy, Judy was saying, this multiple nucleation process, I like that, Judy, you'll have to educate us non-scientists on, on what that means, but I understand what you're saying. It's, it's a... But it's Rather a simple, it, you, you nuke, if you drop one little crystal into a, a material that's readily to crystallize, it'll just keep going. That starts it and then it goes. And yeah. so that's creation. Okay, and, and when you drop it in and it starts and then it keeps going, what's the basic, what's the basic like replication process? In science, it's replication of like. It's like you're dropping it in and you're gonna end up with a giant salt crystal from a saline solution. Um, if it's a different entity, you'll get a different outcome, but it's a joining together of the likes 
in that process. It doesn't have to be that literal though when you're talking about human dynamics. Yeah. It's just the, the idea of where might we start? What might we do? What barriers might we face? What would that be good for? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's beautiful. So, on this issue of of what does what does sovereign mean? Another word is autonomous, as, as Pete's kind of indicating in the chat. And as we've thought about this, like let's go let's go to the flip side, which would probably be the pattern of failure. So, if, if we're trying to come together and work together in service of life and the better future that we all desire, the pattern of failure would probably be. An, um, a centralized top-down unfolding of that where we try to get you know centralized resources and hire more and more people who would all be given instructions from the top on what to do that's what we're trying to avoid and so this this idea of self-organizing sovereigns sovereign autonomous units is really critical i think as the as the fundamental expansion pattern and as pete said it basically means they have everybody has absolute authority over themselves. It's not, nobody is giving up their, their agency to use the word Janice just brought in, their sovereignty, their autonomy, their authority over themselves by joining a federation. What they're doing is they're gaining a, a collective, a community, additional resources, a different additional infrastructure, but that's all in service of, of helping empower those individual autonomous units. I, another component of this, I, I said, when I'm doing something that helps the meta project, I'm helping the meta project as a sovereign. Another part of it is I need to look to other sovereigns, um, either as a, maybe a way to think of this as, as a service provider, I can provide a service to other sovereigns, or they can provide, you know, services to me. Um, so, uh, that coordination, um, needs to happen. So I need to be able to, to have a way to see other sovereigns and what they're doing and what they're interested in. And I have to wait, I, I have to have a way to publish, you know, what, what I'm interested in doing, what I need from other sovereigns. Right. And then we need yeah. to have a way to coordinate and either informally or formally, um, say, you know, basically make make commitments to each other right um like uh like if you help me out with with this thing that i need um and the other person might say well i can do that if you help me out with this thing i need then we've got uh, a commitment to each other to help each other and so that's what builds the the meta project i think is that coordination between sovereigns yeah i agree can and, I, and it, can I just interject for a sec yeah yeah please wendy Okay, one's an operational thing really quickly. I think having five people be in the, it is a little bit harder because it's hard for somebody to signal that they wanna add something to the conversation by turning on their, their camera. Um, and I think it's hard to cycle through five people. So it might be better if we do three, in which case after I say what I'm gonna say, I'm gonna drop off. Um, and also encouraging there's, side conversation happening in chat, which is fine, but maybe encouraging some of those people to actually come on screen and, and speak it into the conversation so that it encourages other people to drop out since that's kind of the nature of, of the way this is done. Um, I think I, I, I'm, I so appreciate the conversation around sovereign and around agency. So I'm just gonna frame it a slightly different way in a way that means a little more to me personally. And, I, and it comes from the assumption that Jordan has so nicely put forward so many times, which is we're all already working towards the meta project, all of us, all the time. And the meta project itself has become a calling card kind of to invite us into more collaborative effort. And so for me, I feel it more as an invitation. Here are the things yeah. that I am doing, as Pete has so rightly said, um, and I agree with. Um, here are the things that I am doing anyway. How can, and then the question becomes, how can that weave with the meta project to be of service also through the meta project as well as through my other things, right? It keeps, I think P is so right that, that it's important to keep that because otherwise my thinking turns towards just one, one 
direction of of listening one only i'm only then listening to what's happening at the meta project i'm no longer listening to the others and as elizabeth had brought in earlier right hearing the patterns through multiple groups is part of the wonderful richness that then is brought into meta so keeping that sovereign agency um and our perspective i think is what's really important to protect um and then the legal and governance all goes with that to me, then, the, if, if we can assume that, then for me, the, the critical edge in question is a little less about the governance for me, although that becomes important, a little more about where and when. It's more of a, what's the right time and place for me to insert something that I have that I want to contribute? Um, because that could be long before I join, join a group. It could be just an idea or just something else. And so I just want to open up those possibilities a little bit. Thanks. That's beautiful, Wendy. Thank you. Hi, Elizabeth. Welcome to the fishbowl. So you invited us to speak in what was in the chat. So what is what I've been dancing with a lot is, you know, how does nature solve this? Um, and I'm talking about bio nature. Uh, in so many ways, it feels like this conversation of, you know, whether we're talking about decentralized, autonomous, you know, whether it's the Dow, you know, DeFi world or this world, we're asking the questions of how to transform hierarchy into something that, uh, with, which has been largely constructed with the consciousness of that era. And the question that I'm wanting to speak into this is, you know, how does nature, how are we more fundamentally wired, you know, looking at our own system? We have this incredibly complicated system, each of us, you know, where a cell is a city and then there are cells that come together to make, you know, organs and all these other components. How is that solved, right? What's the central structures? How does that co- um, develop just I want to speak in biology here because I think we have some just ancient wisdom I'm mean, talking about you know all the evolutionary wisdom that even creates this avatar that I have thank you Elizabeth. Helene can I can I invite you into the into dialogue with uh... I actually am, am interested in talking a little bit about Elizabeth's question well, that's what I was just going to um, involve. We have on the call here someone who might ha have that answer. So, Helene, would you would you be interested in a response to Elizabeth's question on how nature solved these issues? And then um, I'll drop off since Jonathan's in. I'll drop off here for a couple minutes. And I'm going to invite Kilu. Um, I've I've hit positive the question, but we've got a microbiologist also in in our mix. I'd love to have her be in it too. Okay, so we've got a got an indigenous wisdom keeper and a microbiologist. So, so let's. Uh... Thank you, Jolon, for inviting me. Yes, thank you, Elizabeth, for taking that topic because we are nature. Nature is, we are not, it, it, is, it, is, it is us and we have it all inside. And in a way, what we're living and what we're doing, it's, it comes in a sentence through our body, through our cells, through our DNA, through our system. And we all have a knowledge that is beyond everything. That is, we all have ancestors and that is the knowledge is stored in our DNA. So what the voice is saying and what the message I get today is really strong. And it's talking about understanding uh, and not understanding in a fighting way, understanding in a peaceful way. How can we create, like I talked before with Jordan, this bridge to see how we can create a communication, a language. Because to, to look into nature, nature is living in us. All the elements are living in us. We are walking our roots. And we are, we are water, uh, and we have the fire inside, and we have the breath, breath that is our air, and then we have uh, the the other realms too. 
So I, I think in a way is to listen to beyond the words because that is what's coming very strong. The words complicates a lot. And uh, to really, words in my culture where I come from, the words are very, very precious. And they are very strong spirit. And as I use them, I have to use them very carefully because it, it can, how it goes out, but how I also use the words against myself and against the earth. So I think in a way that to, we need to, that is extremely important because she is ready to, to be there for building the bridge now. So thank you, Jordan, for inviting me to talk. Maybe I'll jump in since I got called in. And, and while it's true that I'm trained as a molecular biologist, and well, that's still of the old world, the way we hold the science of molecular biology and the practice of that. But there is the aspect to what Helen speaks of that I think is, is an invitation for us. And it's just forming for me here. So hopefully bear with me. And it's the aspect of we are all part of nature already. There are many things we have forgotten. And maybe we go and get some trainings with the indigenous, right? And then we learn how to reconnect to that, which is all right. It's, it's not learning, it's, rec it's kind of remembering, recognizing, reconnecting and practice. It's not about knowing. We live in a conceptual world. And this whole molecular biology knowledge that I you know, maybe once was trained in, it's knowledge. And the difference is in practice, how do we walk with actually connecting with either I know what it feels like to feel the vibration of the earth or I don't. Either I know what is meant by magnetics, magnetism experience or I don't. If I know it conceptually, that means I don't know it. If I know it experientially, that means I know it. And from there, different communication is possible, different ways of holding ourselves as part of the nature and in connection with everything is possible. And so what's arising is if there's a way for us to, in some ways, model and practice here, even as we're doing all the other stuff as well, even as we're building our you know, business and organizations and however we seek to do our impact thing in the world or whatever it is that we're doing as part of the matter project towards the one thing, if we then also openly practice and have, you know, Helen and others in the world, or those of us who are Western, but are more walking in that practice path, bring it in, not in hiding, not as something that you do on a weekend retreat, but don't tell your office friends or colleagues about, right? But just practice, how can we be here, this complex ecosystem of diverse, different organizations or different cultures, different styles, polarities around the same thing where you know, this won't agree with that. And it looks like conflict, but looking from above, they're both moving in the right, in that same chosen direction. And if we were to practice and the practice might look like, I don't know, just learning how to be more that way. Some of that might be in terms of people offer trainings, others offer, this is what we do and that works. Others might offer, you know, I pretend now I, am a person, let's say, with indigenous or other kind of nature connected access. To me, what you're speaking about, Kilo, looks like X. And in this particular conversation, try Y, right? But sort of walking in practice. Because it's true, we are parts of nature. We've forgotten it. We're trying to remember it. And really what we're asking for is to create this ecosystem that already exists. There's already all of us doing these things it's just that an ecosystem that's not connected yeah we're exactly. looking to connect it i i wanted to speak into the, the fishbowl what i put in chat um and i really like elizabeth's question because it it maps pretty well i think um uh so a liver for instance your, your liver <laughs> uh is a good sovereign um 
Uh, and the way a liver got formed was a bunch of uh, cells that, that wanted to be part of a liver got together and they, they, they said, they said, let's be a liver. Let's do the thing that livers does do best and let's not do anything else. We won't try to be a foot. We won't try to be a brain. We won't try to be a stomach. Um, uh, let's just do the liver thing. And then your liver and your stomach and your gallbladder and your, your brain, uh, your brain kind of overthinks things, but all of those things are sending signals to each other. Um, uh, you know, the, the a signal goes up that, hey, we need more glucose or we need less glucose. Can you flush this for me? Can you do that? And all of the organs do their job as a sovereign, but they also create a thing together, a fleet of things working together that coordinate and make sure that everything gets done, right? So I, I and, and another interesting thing, and I think this is for advanced kind of thinking, but you know, there's a hierarchy there too. Um, uh, your liver uh, is part of a larger system of organs that work together and that's separate from the muscle system, musculature system. Those things have to work together, but they kind of have different sets of, of sovereigns working within them. And then, they get smaller and bigger, right? Inside your liver is a bunch of cells. Each of the cells, as Jonathan was saying, is a, is a little sovereign all by itself doing its you know, liver cell thing. Um, it knows how to do that really well. It wouldn't be able to do the job of the liver all by itself. It needs a bunch of other friends doing the same, you know, similar thing, working together. And then inside your cell, you know, there's mitochondria. Mitochondria are things that got swept into, um, uh, bigger animal cells a long, long, long time ago. And mitochondria are kind of like doing their own thing. Um, they don't really think about how they're part of a larger system. Um, so that there is, if you'll notice, there is a hierarchy there um, that's also important. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that hierarchy is necessarily bad, um, but you want to have things doing their jobs separately and then have all of that coordinate together to make a harmonious whole. Um, you don't want the liver to say, okay, um, this is kind of where cancer comes in, right? Um, cancer cell goes, hey, um, I, know how to make, uh, I know how to make more cancer cells. <laughs> and pretty soon, you know, it's all taking over and you don't have differentiable functions again. You, everybody's being a cancer cell and you end up uh, killing the system. So you, you, that, that hierarchy can be good and it can be poisonous, right? And we, I think the folks here believe that we've kind of gotten into ourselves, uh, gotten ourselves into a kind of a poisonous feedback loop where we're building uh, essentially a, a cancer body rather than building a harmonious whole. Excellent. Yeah, um, sovereigns in a hierarchical network where our res each sovereign's responsibility um, is uh, available to the broader network and the um, flow from one sovereign to another um, and so on throughout the hierarchy is optimized uh, by some mysterious force, which I'll want to get to in one second, um, to produce the most robust possible ultra sovereign that we can be, which is kind of what we're setting ourselves up for. Uh, I want to point out that this mysterious force is, is a feedback loop that is provided in nature by the evolutionary process, which takes forever. Since we're in kind of a hurry, we have to provide, it seems to me, uh, evolution, feedback loops, error correction, error avoidance, you know, all kinds of really um, difficult um, processes that yeah, we kind of don't do in our current civilization. Uh, so evolution is one thing. And, and the other part of that is 
pods um, or sovereigns or cells or whatever grow and grow over time. And to do that, um, we need to be able to take in new people and embrace them, make them welcome, maybe even heal them. Like, you know, I'm undergoing healing over being a stupid idiot. Um, and um, learn and eventually become masterful within their pod. And I see those two things as important to add to um, the cellular nature picture. It's beautiful, Jonathan. I've been thinking a lot about, it's like we're, we're at this, this phase change. So, so I really like the, for, I guess I just wanna say the proposal that, that we put out was basically about federating. And what we're now talking about is federating in a way that's perfectly aligned with the principles of nature. And we talked earlier about this moment of phase shift where we're kind of transitioning from one type of a social construction to something different that could be either better or worse. And what we're, I think all here in service of is trying to do that in the best and most conscious possible way so that the thing we transition to is perfectly realigned and reintegrated with the living system that, that sustains us all. And so it's almost, Jonathan, like there's a opportunity for us to consciously participate maybe for the first time in human history in this whole like phase shift quantum evolution of the human system into something totally different than it's ever been before. And I think that's where this idea of like agency or co-creation is so critical. It's like that, that phase shift is coming no matter what. And I think we're being invited to consciously participate in and yeah, be agents of guide, guide that, you know, to the degree that we can try to sense and discern. And so it, it creates an amazing both like burden or responsibility, but opportunity of like the greatest humility and honor to try to figure out how to be a part of that thing that's happening that's so bigger than us. Uh, humility that implies uh, being willing to be told, hey, you said you're responsible for this. Can you change that? Can you be responsible for something a little different? And if and the idea here I'm promoting is that as uh, sovereigns, we can talk to each other about what our purpose is as a sovereign. Hey, I'd like your purpose to be a little different. And in that way we can evolve to become the most harmonious whole. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate that. Bill and Kiwi, welcome. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. I um, just wanted to chime in to uh, just share what, from my perspective, is on what you and I have been doing for a couple of years here, Jordan. And um, we haven't really, I haven't really said much about this in this particular meeting, but I wanted to share it briefly. Um, Jordan and I have been working together for several years on putting together a structure that can actually be infinitely expandable, well-organized, hierarchically appropriate, cellular sensitive, and be a, a great way to, without, wealth overhang and without interference and without missing proper legal constraints, support and encourage a whole. As, and so we've been, the whole Lionsburg idea has been um, pretty well developed as an idea. And so I'm rewriting some, we wrote, we, we put together some things and um, I helped write a, 57 page manifesto on what that structure would be for Lionsburg a couple of years ago. And then COVID had its, um, and other things had their effect. And, um, and I put almost full-time effort into this for almost a year. So 
just so you all know that this is we've been working on some things that are will be pre I'll be presenting and for uh, group critique, you know, as a, as a, a way of looking at things, but we developed it as a way to serve um, those doing exactly this. And uh, we're just looking forward to, I'm looking forward to um, finishing a new iteration of that and then submitting it for review <laughs> and falsification if necessary, you know, speaking of science here. So just wanted to throw that out there. For anybody that doesn't know, know Bill after networking through dozens of attorneys trying to figure out how we could create structures to facilitate this emergence. Um, Bill was able to help bring together a lot of threads and articulate something that, that might work. And if it's useful to the network, it's a free gift to you. And if it's if it gets falsified or it's not the right answer, we'll gladly lay it down in service of whatever wiser answers are out there because our duty is to truth and to advancing and meeting this moment in history. So, Kilo. Love it. Thank you, Bill, for and Jordan for uh, for the work and for outlining it. And you know, I was almost going to lower my hand and go off fishbowl. So I had this moment of bravery, and then I had this moment of fear. And now I'm here. And I'm sort of in between. But what I was going to do is invite. Just let me back up. I want to go back to the let's practice and let's model and let's figure out how to be with each other in such a way that's practical. And then, Bill, you started speaking about a, a framework within which that being is already codified, maybe not from the culture perspective, but from you know what's possible, what's supported, what's right, right? Like that more concrete perspective. I'm very interested in learning about it. And I'd love to issue an invitation for people who have sort of worldly, regular types of efforts um, to try to just practice what that looks like to engage in a way that I feel done here. For example, Jordan, I've made you uncomfortable, I know a little bit, by holding you a little bit under the microscope because I'm so curious about how do you lead in that way that achieves so much in this rich way that carries information as well as context, as well as heart, as well as makes a spaciousness in which we can all show up at our higher and the trust. And then for many other people here, I could make similar comments. There's something about the culture that is being modeled here that I am learning from. And so that makes me want to do more of that for others who come in who may not know. And I'm the perfectly wrong person to volunteer to do that culture thing. Because I'm not you know, a coach or a psychologist and all these other titles that I would think go with culture. I'm an innovation funder in a you know, particular world that if you think of Wall Street, it's a little gentler than that, but not by a lot. You think of Silicon Valley, that's about it. And so I think it would be extra interesting to have, you know, the lawyers, the business people, the product managers, the whoever's, right? That don't usually speak this well together to practice and to figure out what is that magic and what is that sauce where we show up as ourselves with a little extra courage. Because obviously there's also, also a reason I'm here. There's something beyond, you know, that, that other role and we're all, we all have some aspect of that, whatever our roles are. But some of that must be bottle level, bad word, must be something that we can put in the bottle and offer to others. And much of it will be like in the olden days, the guild masters and apprentices. It was yeah. modeled to them how to be. And so how do we do that? I'm interested in that how, and if anyone else is interested in that how, I think that belongs since day one and we're going to learn from experience of doing. And if there's anyone who knows how to train that and coach that, and of course, they would be very good for that. But I think that as an ecosystem of many different diverse organizations and efforts, 
we're all going to be learning together. And if we want to learn and model, I think that should be somewhere, you know, should have a place here, not just to talk about, but do. And I'm going to trip and fall and do all the wrong things, at least some of the time. I know that. But that's what makes me right to do it. Thanks, Kira. Yeah, that, that guild patterning um, seems apparent as one of the things that needs to emerge really early here. Uh, and and Kilu, uh, I just invite you also to, you're one of the most appropriate and perfect people for what you just suggested. So I'd also invite you to see yourself a little bit more clearly and uh, we all see that in you. Eric and Helene, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Kilo, for bringing that in. Um, I mean, for me, we are all unique and we have different stories and different knowledge. And we have making, like Jordan said before, us and someone else, we have done mistakes and life is a teaching and we are who we are. That's why, I mean, I, I have worked in the systematic world before and it was really hard to dedicate myself to the call because who am I? Who am I to walk my wisdom? And uh, so I think to be honest and also to trust ourselves, you know, for the, for the, my grandmother, she always said, Helen, trust your stomach feeling, you know, when I, I was had a very insecure child and asking for questions. And she said always, just close your eyes and trust your stomach feeling. And what are your body saying? How, what is it saying? Because it was the mostly of the teaching was beyond words. And um, I'm very grateful to have it, but I closed that door for many, many years and go in and another to be the good girl and educate myself and really. So I think in, in what I see also, and I'm very grateful to be in this group, is that we can learn so much from each other and that is how we can build. Uh, so that is why I feel very inspired and also feeling the call to, to be with you was for the work I do and how I can support from, from being the wisdom keeper I am. So, thank you. Um, okay, I feel a lot of movement in me and I, I'd like to be able to clearly say a few things. Um, if I look at something like a meta project, um, there's a dimension which is completely different than what people you're used to do, I would say. What is meta, really? And there's many aspects to it, and I'm going to name a few just to get a sense of what it is. Um, one thing, for instance, is neutrality. N neutrality is impossible. I have opinions. I will put them out and I will be triggered to when, when something, some pain is heard or I have a very strong sense of, oh, I'm really convinced of this and I'll speak up about it. But my intention is to constantly question myself, to look at myself again and again and to see, is this right or not? Does this feel right or not? And that's, that's kind of work also for me. It's not a, necessarily an easy position to be in um, and that makes me a very difficult workshop participant for instance because i question everything and that can be unhealthy in the sense that it's sometimes it can block you to move forward but at the same time it also allows me to see and to look at and to look at again and then again and again and I tend to agree with people and disagree at the same time, all the time. Makes it also really difficult for my brain to then understand, okay, what are all the levels going on at the same time? And then in this whole project, like, 
like the analogies with nature yeah beautiful makes some sense it has meaning but at the same time there's something which is also very deeply nature like two days ago i was listening to a podcast which is about atoms and atoms are usually seen as or pictured as planets orbiting each other and then okay oh that's a beautiful model and the the small is also the big because the planets are the same as the atoms but then actually when when scientists really were looking at this issue that's one of the representations that were happening beginning of 20th century but then after they said no it's it's actually really not a correct representation of yeah. atoms <laughs> it's much different and when I heard that, I was like, whoa, I don't know what the world looks like. I really don't. And that happens to me a lot. Yeah. I am looking at something and I don't know anymore. And then the second part of that is that what I'm looking to create is something that holds and that gives possibility for other things to happen rather than me speaking the wisdom. Yeah. I, I think I have on many levels a lot of wisdom. I can sense into groups and I can sense very deep things. I can work with trauma, the deepest kind of trauma, and can give space to it. I could, I, I think I could work with people who have war trauma and work with it effectively. But still, what I do is give space, and and I reconfigure myself again and again and again to create space, to hold space. But in, but then if I'm talking about platforms, for me, I'm really looking at. I, I said this before: how to hold all the complexity, how to give space to all the parallel strategies, parallel ways of thinking, different opinions, how to embrace the deepest kind of conflicts and paradoxes and all of that. And it's a very difficult job to do. And that's the job that I've been doing and I'm getting better at it. I'm not, I'm still not an expert. It's the, and it's also kind of the opposite of an expert, but I'm also an expert in this because I've been working on it for a long time. So, so I'm both, and, and that's also again jarring for the mind. And then I think the last level of that is like, wow, listening to all of this, it's so much for my mind. I have a, have a limited capacity bandwidth energy. And let, let's say that if I compare it to a processor or a computer, like, I, like what is the batch that makes most sense for me to process now? Because I really process really deeply. If any topic I go into, I focus into it and I'm like, I see so many um, different perspectives and so many different layers and depth and and, and structure and um, what, what is it called? Like, uh, I, there's so much I can see, it, but it, I still don't see myself as the expert or the one that knows, even if I see, see so many layers, the more I see, the more I realize, I, the less I know. That's also this kind of Taoistic thing. Yeah, but it's yeah. still like we are still learning again how to be this meta, how to put ourselves back into a seat of observing. Oh, this I'm doing. I'm in this dynamic, and also to see the dynamics between things. Like systems thinking for me is also something like seeing dynamics often there's images in my mind which are dynamic. It's a bit like how cells evolve. But then at the same time, I'm always open to what I'm not seeing, my blind spots, and to re keep on remembering what I don't see and I don't know. Those are a few levels and, and they all kind of work together to create a kind of attitude, composure, uh, position, and then it it means that I try to deeply perceive and see the reality as it is for somebody else, instead of giving my own reality, even if my own reality is so rich. I, it's full of paradox, but yeah, this is how I can <laughs> express it right now. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for, thank you for expressing that, Eric. Yeah, I agree. I think there's something really structurally uh, related to creating the something that holds and creates possibility for other things and not knowing, like maybe those two things are inex inextricably linked. So, because if we know, then, then we will stomp on the emergence, so to speak, right? If we don't know, and we hold that, then that kind of opens the possibility that 
someday together we might know it opens up a search it opens up like a a space of inquiry and i think the moment that you lose that and you decide okay well we know now we have it figured out you you kill the space of emergence almost right and so i think that that's fundamentally the proper relationship it's like fundamentally the proper relationship to the mystery of that which creates and sustains our life and consciousness that we're even trying to grapple with and so stepping back to that place of not knowing and then being okay being there and then figuring out what we can do based on that i think is a really powerful powerful frame wendy welcome and last yeah and last polarity there i think also is like it's not completely correct the way i say it but it's one way of looking at it it's like the the western way of looking at morality what's good and bad what is better and um it's kind of what is the ethical best and then maybe maybe the eastern concept of looking at process and dynamics and i don't know if it's east and west either but it's something like that as well yeah, yeah. and um, that's, I understand. that's yeah. mm. there's something turning up in terms of placing action in the right scale from a um interaction point of view because um, and I'm not trying to be too linear here, but you can only know things through some form of action. And you could say that thought is action, but doing is action um, in the very um, foundational way, just taking a breath, even just breathing is an action. Um, so that's a good way of holding space when you think that you might overact. Um, and I'm certainly in that place at the moment around some of the things that are happening with me. And I'm learning from that. I'm trying to learn from that. but. To actually understand anything, you have to make some form of interaction with you. You have to touch something, talk to someone. It's all about keeping that little bit of momentum going. But right-sizing that is really difficult because sometimes it's the right time to do something tiny and sometimes it's the right time to do something larger. And, you know, the knowing of the doing and just the little cycles behind and around that are really important. Um, so I've had a little bit of help recently from other people and I feel like I'm a bit flip floppy around this, you know, it's like righteous action. I've got to do something here, but then you can often mess up things that are nascent things that just needed a little bit more observing. Um, and I think perhaps what this group can do for each person and what we can do for the group is to help help each person understand the scale of the thing that they could do so we don't mess up things that are actually already sort of working because as dave snowden talks about all the time he says it's about re sort of deconstructing and reconstructing but you can de deconstruct so far that you've got nothing to work with or you right. can construct so much that there is no affordance and knowing no the whole system is so tightly welded because of the scale of the things you put into it you can't unweld it like money has scale buildings have scale bridges have scale you can only cross them a certain way because somebody has said this is the size the thing has to be but to keep the whole system moving and allow myself to be an observer in the system and learn through actions i need to be able to do these little micro movements and and sometimes people need to like encourage me to do the bigger thing and sometimes I need to say no time and space the nest isn't quite the right shape the thing you want to put into it is just going to make the nest go out of balance it's going to tip sideways and all little birds will fall out <laughs> and then you can't get the nest back up in the sky or on the tree because the thing you did just broke everything yeah yeah um, yeah so scale and action and having other people just kick you in the shins when you're doing something and I'm quite capable of breaking things. Sometimes they need to be broken and sometimes you break something you care a lot about and um, the wisdom that can come to us just to help us. And the word from Ken yesterday was um, tend and friend <laughs> around a situation I find myself in and I find it really hard to hold myself back sometimes because the thing in me wants the action and the thing, the very thing I shouldn't do is act at scale. Um, yeah. So, you know, serenity prayer, if you want to remember that thing and wherever it came from, um, yeah. when action and what size, 
and the wisdom around that. That feels so key. It feels so key to this, um, this idea of like the sensitivity to emergence and green shoots and like the cultivation, because it's so easy to, to accidentally stomp on something that's so beautiful, right? And then another thing that triggers for me, Wendy, is this idea that someone earlier said, you know, we co-create our reality through our words deeper it's almost like we co-create the reality through our attention maybe and so you said something about like attending to and noticing things and and that's been such a powerful thing like even as we're acting and trying to carry things out to be so sensitive to noticing the little green shoots that are emerging and then just attending to them just like even paying attention maybe is a really big thing maybe you don't need to do anything you just need to attend to it and then you'll know if someday you need to do something. But I, I think that element of like attending to things is really an interesting place that precedes action somehow. And then I, I hear you saying there's a right-sized action depending on what you're dealing with that flows from that attention, but you need to like understand the thing first to then take the right size action. And Judy, Judy Bentham's spoken a lot to that too. Uh, noticing the right size of action that's available to everybody. Eat. Thanks, Jordan. And thanks, Wendy. I, I really like that um, understanding of the scale of the thing that, that you can do. And, and I also wanted to recall what Keila was talking about, um, modeling um, being a sovereign. And I wanted to suggest uh, just, just this past week, uh, some experiences have made me think about how to be a sovereign um, and how to start being a sovereign when you don't know what that means. And one of the one of the, the guidelines or best, I wouldn't say best practices, one of the one of the guidelines maybe to think about is um, it's it's kind of hard to be a single person sovereign. Um, uh, it's easier if you're two or especially three. Um, when you have three people, you can have just like we're doing in fishbowl, you can have some reflection from different angles about what you're thinking about. And so um, a, a thing that maybe as, as sometimes I act as a sovereign coach, <laughs> um, a thing that I, I didn't think to coach somebody about being a sovereign was to get together with uh, another person or two and talk about the idea, the, the scale of the thing that you wanted to do and work that out inside your little nascent, your, your early, very early beginning sovereign. Talk about that together as a group and then reach out to the network. Um, what, what happened instead was, um, uh, it, it's in, this is in another place, but um, one person, said, hey, I know how this network works. I'm gonna jump in and do this thing. And here's, you know, here's the thing I want to help with. And the, the scale was kind of off. Um, and I think if that person had worked together with, with another person or even better, two people, they could have talked through the idea and, the, and together a, a group brain is, is easier um, and, and more reflective about, about things. So I, I don't know if that's, that's a, a good thing or a bad thing. And, and as it happens, I'm in several one person sovereigns, several, several, several different one person sovereigns. Um, but I've had a lot of practice doing that. Um, I've been doing it for decades. Um, I come from the startup world where sovereigns was not a weird thing. Um, and the first ones that I attempted were two, two person, three person, you know, four person groups together. And it didn't make sense, you know, for all, we couldn't shoulder everything that the sovereign needed to do as one person or even two people. Um, you needed to be three people or four people sometimes. So, um, so then I think we haven't, we haven't really affected this well yet, but the idea of the request for guidance kind of structure, it occurs to me that that's less for an individual, how do I fit in? But it's it works better if it's for a sovereign, 
for a sovereign to say, hey, three of us got together and came up with this idea and we've, we've knocked it around a bunch ourselves. Other sovereigns and, and sovereign whispers, what do you think? Are, you know, is this scale match what we're trying to do? And does this scale fit into the network? How does it fit into the network? What other sovereigns should we be working with? Should we absorb ourselves? You know, should we join another sovereign that's doing the same thing that we want to do? That reminds me, I wanted to also just an, another reflection that I've had today was that it's it's we we worry a little bit about duplicating effort and about stepping on other people's toes and things like that. One of the things that you do when you're a sovereign, it's like, well, I'm not stepping on anybody's toes because we're we're one sovereign. We've decided right, right. together as a group how not to how to dance together without stepping on each other's toes. And we're by definition, we're just not stepping on anybody else's toes because we're doing our own thing. I think to it's it it's tempting from our experience living in business culture for the past you know couple hundred years 100 200 years how to do business we've learned these efficiency lessons right well you can't have duplication you can't you know other weird things like you can't work together i think what i've learned from working with the sovereigns you know in the network over the past year and a half is that very similar sovereigns end up doing different things they just naturally are are aligned to certain things and even when they're working on the same like overarching goal, maybe they do it a little bit differently. So yeah, I think we yeah. don't have to worry too much about bumping into each other and we don't have to worry too much about duplicating. We do. It's really important to communicate with each other and coordinate and say, hey, it looks like you're doing exactly the same thing we're doing. Let's join the forces or let's I, I can stop doing that now. Thank goodness I can do yeah, things yeah, that are more yeah. interesting to me. I think that's so that's so critical, Pete. So I, I love what you just said. And to, so to reflect that back, you're saying that um, like an individual is a little bit. Yeah, so there, there's a process that we're walking through of, of evolution. And if we have our network, it's good for an individual to grab a couple other people to put a group mind to something to orient to what's around. Right. And then to kind of take that and put it out for guidance on how that fits with the other thing. And so it's kind of like an interim step. And then I think the other really key thing that you said that might be one of the most critical like success or failure things on scale is if we have a, uh, if we have a mosaic of the different tiles that are functions that need to be covered. And if, if a group sees a gap and wants to take action autonomously to do something about it, they shouldn't ever look at that tile and go, okay, well, it's covered. I'm going to be stepping on their toes if I also do this. Like that should be welcomed and celebrated that. And then each of those will, will operate differently. So I, so I think that that's like a really critical principle of the patterning. I saw that so much in trying to build businesses as you end up, it's like you want a conceptual hierarchy of organization so that things can work. But oftentimes, if that hierarchy is accompanied by the wrong kind of authority or something or perceived authority, then it quashes emergence instead of being upside down as like the ecosystem that celebrates lots of growth out of all these themes, right? So I think somehow we need to figure out how to turn that entire hierarchical organizational structure upside down so it reflects like a planet that is giving rise to life. and in a very different way i see that um actually with the organization that i'm sort of problematic in at the moment um, it's been set up so youth to self-lead but it comes from a really colonizing sort of setup that's when it started it was all about having this sort of command and control structure and so it ends up eating itself what happens is the messaging at the bottom level is you can self-organize around risk. You can self-organize around activities. Go for it. And at the top level, it doesn't allow, because I guess the top level actually has to be a buffer to the real world where you have to manage risk according to certain rules of governance, which include, um, you know, standards and all the things that infrastructure, I mean, it's around a built-in structure, infrastructure project that I'm experiencing this. And you know, you've got all these standards, you've got all these rules that say how you're supposed to do things.
but the top layer has got so used to using old command and control structure that it can't let the layer underneath, which it has very carefully constructed to be a new leadership thing grow. So it's actually saying, hey, little shoot, come off and be a really shoot. And then this big foot is actually hovering on the top and can't yeah, notice itself. Yeah. And it's like, wow, you just quit, you spent all this time creating exactly the sort of distributed, um, co-evolving live system where you want youth to actually do the thing, you know, organize yeah, themselves yeah. into the new lot of leaders. And the whole system that created that can't reinvent itself to allow that thing happening. So it's like the shoot and the boot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The boot no, can't see itself. And the shoot is saying, the shoot is so like, you know, not quite big enough yet. And it can't flip and do the other thing because the boot's just in the way. You just want to kick the boot out of the way, but the boot represents the society and, you know, the need to have all these things that you're supposed to do, which are often the wrong thing in the situation. And the real irony in all of this is that the group itself actually has permission to use situational leadership and Ken Blanchard's work formally has use of that and is not applying it to itself at the governance layer. It's saying, you guys, you can do it, but we're not doing that game. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're killing anyone who actually sends a message that it's not working. Like, no. Yeah. Don't do this, please. Don't do this. Well, we it's... we got it. Yeah, we got a glimpse of that exact thing here. I think this week uh, that was uh, so that and that was the exact image that came to my mind. It's like, okay, well, here's this helpful structure that helps emergence, and then there's a green shoot, and it it gets stomped on somehow by the stricture of the perceived structure <laughs> it's like um so that's a really really interesting thing so so that's that's the key i think that turning this whole thing upside down the true functioning of an ecosystem in a different way where you have all like the carbon the topsoil the resources the nutrients like everything and you're just fostering emergent life and if if something springs up and it doesn't work out it's like okay great we learned right um but it's it's a different way of doing that so that's that's so critical thanks Hey, Michael. Hey, Bill. Um, a quick comment on that. <clears throat> I've uh, very much liked, uh, like, like I shared with you this morning, Jordan, by text, that account in the New Testament where Jesus tells his disciples, if you want to be great, you have to be the servant of all. And it's a, and that, a, a governance that is really a servant leadership is flipped to serve all instead of be overall. So hierarchy, which is necessary, there has to be hierarchy in a structure, like in a body, as Pete was referring to. But if, it, if we look at ourselves in any situation where we have any leadership as being a servant, then we have this great responsibility to understand what are the, the needs of the people we're serving, how can we help them to become all that they're meant to be. And in Wendy's comment about uh, governance being um, an obstruction is very important. We can't allow our governance structure to be uh, to destroy um, people underneath. Anyways, that's all I need to say about that. Yeah, yeah, so critical. Thanks, Bill. Michael. Um, yeah, I just wanted to. Um, I was I was struck by what Pete said, and he somewhat um, uh, answered something I brought up in the chat, but wanted to put a finer point on it that um, relates to this this image of all of humanity as the body, and you know our the 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 cells the cells are sovereigns, but they aren't out for themselves. <laughs> Um, and they're not, you know, for the most part, they're not competing with each other. And that's kind of what we're wanting to bring is, you know, we're all in this body, we're all cells in this, in this body together. Um, and, and it's okay. You know, the, the, the difficult thing is we've fallen out of that, um, that way of 
whether we were ever in it. I mean, certain societies, I think we're in it, certain indigenous societies more than, than you know, uh, you know, currently dominant societies. And how, how do we reachieve that, that notion of being together? And, you know, are we, earlier I'd said in the chat, so if we're talking about this idea of the harmonious body working together, are we making that body or does that body already exist? And I would say it does, you know, we're, we're cells in that body saying, hey, we understand that we have a purpose in the greater whole and we want to be right with that and, and be part of a healthy body. Let's strengthen the connections that we have as, as cells in this body, but we're not building a new body. We're not the new brain. We're not the, you know, we're, we're just cells <laughs> like everybody else. Um, and I feel like I'm, I'm kind of beating this drum frequently, just, you know, how, how we, when, when Pete was making the mention of the, um, three people coming together in casual conversation before making an offering as a sovereign to a greater group. Likewise, um, the, the casual conversations between groups like ours, like, you know, Winfinity, Wendy was mentioning recently, like, you know, and, and so many groups that exist, cultures that exist, you know, think of them as organs in the body, I'm not sure, but you know, we're, we're, all, we're all trying to draw ourselves into connection and collaboration as opposed to competition. Um, you know, a lot of times when people look at nature as a model, they have it in their head that, oh, it's survival of the fittest and everybody's out for themselves, but that's not really it. Everybody's just being some of the, ways of the food chain involve some eating others but they're all made of cells and those cells are all you know decomposing and feeding plants and you know all that so um anti-competition which again <laughs> gets back to that age-old problem of money um is is just really you know, live for me in this in this conversation as something that we have to to strive for and be humble around. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. So, Michael, you said the magic word, the money, and that's when my hand went up right away. Right, I think that is very important to turn into a turn into a positive for this group, because it is true that as we aggregate the efforts that are already out there, we make them visible and findable and fundable, and there's value to that. And so I'm a little bit of a broken record to those who know me, at least professionally around the importance of value, right? Finding value, recognizing value, building value, maximizing, optimizing, all of that about value. I think it's one of the absolute key filters for us, not as a, you know, I don't know, that, because it's something that people talk about, but because if I know that it's valuable for me to be a part of this group, because it increases my chances of being seen as legitimate, as credible, and fundable, in addition to all the stuff that feels good and is useful for me for my internal purposes, such as like-minded creatures working towards the same goal, and, you know, all that less tangible also value perhaps for me, but it helps me in that harder world of fundability, recognition, marketing, reputation, you know, again, legitimacy and credibility, which are important because a lot of folks who are further in front, you know, they're small, they're starting, they're fledgling because that's how the edge in the front looks like. And where we can provide strength, we being the, the whole project, when well run and when aggregated into strength, it's a global thing, that's value. So let's think of what all kinds of different aspects of value there are that we can 
find and recognize and build and maximize, optimize, as well as transact on, as well as, you know, invite others into. It's also of value to funders. It's also of value to people on the outside providing whatever they'd want to provide. And I think that's so key because then if we, if we're able to turn as much of this potential strengths into actual recognized strengths, it's easier for us because, you know, who has to them more will be given. We want to be the who has. I'd like to respond to that. Um, money is a hot button for me too. And I think <clears throat> I think what we've done as a species is we kind of accidentally find ourselves uh, fully committed to the capitalist system where profit is um, the driving force for everything. And uh, as a consequence, shareholders end up driving consumer, the design of consumer devices, the uh, the support process consumers can expect from a corporation after they've bought a product is usually pretty crappy because uh, that's that doesn't generate profit. Uh, my point here is that we've accidentally chosen to optimize profit and to to the point of what's valuable. Well, lots of other things are valuable. Uh, nurturing is valuable. Creativity is valuable. Those are not being optimized right now. So to Michael's point of we've already got the functioning full-size unit, I'm, I'm thinking that the metaphor of cancer might be uh, appropriate to describe this profit-driven system that it's taken over the body, to use that metaphor. And so the usual intervention is surgical. Uh, I don't think that's going to work. I think Bucky Fuller says it right by saying, we need to create something that works better. For that reason, I think we are building something new. I think Jordan is saying we need a place. And I, I fully agree because I think the place that the human race has been relying on has been uh, hijacked, it is no longer reliable. Um, so to everything everyone's saying, these, there's a fantastic number of ideas here. But to me, they all sum up into um, we're going to have to think outside the box. And we're going to have to think about the consequences. And that's a really hard thing to do. Uh, as we divide ourselves up into pods, uh, it's really easy to get micro-focused and lose track of... Well, it's important to be micro-focused for Pete's reasons, because, hey, you know, it fits our ability, our brain power and our ability to organize. But I think a overarching coordination uh, needs to be available as a sovereign that all these other pods can draw on. You know, yeah. we're, we're in trouble. Uh, what pods can we go to? Or we need this. What pods can provide it? And just broadcasting that doesn't seem to be... Um, I, I don't believe that'll work. I yeah. think we need to go, you know, to uh, the federation, 
our federation's complaint desk or something yeah, you know, and yeah. say or a hospital or psychiatry ward or whatever you know yeah. help <laughs> yeah yeah i think that's that's really critical jonathan uh, so thanks for those yeah, thanks for those reflections and, and it's such a big tension because i think we've been so abused by any kind of organizational structure that there's there's kind of this idea that maybe a, a completely distributed autonomous not coordinated thing will somehow work so i think you're rightly pointing out this tension that it it's unlikely to and there needs to be this balance of of co voluntary coordination and enough places of infrastructure and support and being able to find it so that you can actually get what you need and so the, we can talk about how to properly structure what you're saying but but um, i agree with this idea there needs to be these help desks so to speak and we can set that up structurally properly uh, but thanks for thanks for surfacing that you mind if i add a couple more tidbits sure um help desks uh need to be um, occupied by someone who's um, well-trained at the level of training that, well, kind of vastly exceeds the kind of training a typical help desks get right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, s secondly, that um, human beings have these emotions that, you know, have a bad rap but they have a really good rap for, for a question like, is our help desk working for us? Yeah, yeah. And the emotions are either gonna say, hell yeah, or God, no. Yeah, yeah. And that's a very useful evolutionary tool to use. Yeah. It, and we do it pretty easy. It's like no brainer. And <laughs> yeah, and Pete, Pete and I have kind of talked about that gets back to this patterning. If there's if there's multiple help desks, right? There's multiple people who uh, say, "Hey, we want to support the network, and here's the kind of help you can get from us." Then that that helps the right kind of um, patterning too, as opposed to one bureaucratic help desk that we're trying to minimize the costs of, so to speak, right? Like you're talking about, right? So so we want that to be a really robust robust function. So Judy. You're muted, Judy. And I'll probably, I, I need to go at about, I, I should wrap up in 15 minutes here. Go at uh, three o'clock here Pacific time. I was just going to say that I'm feeling a little um, questioning reaction to the word governance just because of the implications of how it's been used historically. And I'd love to see affinity groups that frame alternative approaches to their sovereign's definition. I think we're going to have yeah. clusters of sovereigns, some of whose values are aligned, others that are quite disparate. And that's exactly what we would want for the richness of the community so that each little sovereign or big sovereign is aligned around its core values. And we're aware of their core values and how we would intersect them as a different sovereign or as an individual or what I could learn from them what they've learned from mistakes, what they've learned from positives, all of those dimensions. There's a tremendous opportunity for shared wisdom and it's least served the more collectively organized we get. The more individuality we maintain, the greater the wisdom and creativity that I think we'll generate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Agreed, and that's the other really central thing I think about this, this emergence pattern that, that we've been talking about on the call is that lets lots of things spring up even in the same areas that can have different, different patterns. But I think this, this idea that um, there's already these tribes or proclivities or cultures or sets, right? And we don't wanna ask people to leave those to become part of something else. It's like, I, I think Michael, you were putting it well. It's almost like, okay, we're we're part of these little things and we're trying to recognize that we're also part of the whole and begin to function together as if that was true and as if our life depended on it. And so it's it's kind of a recognition and response. Um, yeah, I agree completely, Judy.
Um, I, I, I think I, I need to speak a bit into the unknown for me right now. Um, so I'm really curious how this is going to come out. But something like... Um, I've, I've done so much research on so many different topics. And the, the way I hear this um, conversation evolving is like... It's like brain training the whole time for me. And it's, I don't know if it's the best way for me, for me to evolve what I want to, um, what I want to create. But then I ask myself, okay, well, what is it then? And I, I have no current answer to that. But also, whenever I'm honest, I don't want to break anything down. Like, because this, this is serving like what might not be serving me is serving other people really deeply. So it's not about pointing the whole thing in a direction, but it's really what I need and where I am in my journey right now. I know I need a lot of talking to people. I think that's one part I need to talk to be able to process and process and process, but it's a lot of talking and realistically, I don't know how to make that happen. It's a bit like the question, Oh, I would like community in my life. And then I go to a community. I, I went to Fintorn, I went to other places. And I need notice all the problems in that community. And I try to help solve those problems and have, have a supportive community around me so that I can finally process all that I have in me. But that's not been working. And I have this really open question, like, how can I meet more people where I can talk? And I can actually really process things, but it doesn't add up on top of all the things that I already have to process, but that it's really processing what I already have worked through, but to a level that finally the pieces can fall into place somehow. Um, so it might be, I can talk in service of me processing things. It's not other people adding their own ideas to mine, even if they're valuable, even if I haven't seen everything, the first thing I right now need to do is really talk a lot to people to be able to to relax, to let my also just my nervous system to calm down. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I've had it with many calls like, oh, so many beautiful people, so many beautiful ideas. But somewhere along the line of those calls, I get so full that I can't really process it anymore. And that's different for different people. For some, it might be really meaningful to go really deep and, and all these different ideas. For me, I know this, no, I really need to process more. And I've done that, for instance, yesterday with Sofia, and it really was helpful. I was, it allowed me to really work through. And it's a lot of repetition as well, like, because that balancing act is just all these ideas bumping into each other. And then finally, something might fall down and then I can step back into the bigger group, for instance. And I've yeah. been here and I really want to be part of this, but I also feel this really strong need to say this because it's, I don't think I'm the only one that's one part. I, and also that it's the, it's just what I need. Yeah, simple, simply put. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, yeah. So I want to validate that, Eric, that's like, um, especially when we're wrestling with these outer levels of abstraction, like mm -hmm. I know you are trying to get your mind around the biggest possible things. It's like, man, you can just about blow yourself up if you don't articulate it. Um, and so, and, mm -hmm. and then I understand what you're saying. It, it like, it takes, it's, it's not a minor thing. Like, so for instance, to be able to even try to start expressing this took me maybe three years of writing three hours a day hundreds of thousands of words and hundreds of pages like and rewriting over and over again to yeah. try to even begin to see what was trying and it and it felt agonizing and frustrating because it's like it's like I don't I don't know and I, I hope this isn't a wildly inappropriate thing to say but the only thing I could feel in my being was it was like trying to give birth it's like something that I don't yeah. understand is like trying to come forward and it's agonizing and so what you're saying is is so critical right and so i guess i would just say that i agree with you that we're never going to be able to have those kind of deep interactions in a group like this 
And so I think that the correct pattern is like, like you're saying, a lot of people might need that. And there's, there's some set of the group that needs that. It takes time and space. Right. And so I think we need to facilitate the emergence of the places where we can do that. Right. It's like, so um, I guess all I can say is that just on behalf of behalf of myself and the universe that loves you, like, please let's, let's figure out how to answer that question for you mm-hmm. in a way that answers it for everybody else that also needs that. And I, and I think this, this kind of patterning that we're talking about is right where you find at least a couple other people that are willing to go there with you, right. And to walk in the depths that you want to walk in. And that's not going to be everybody, but you can find those couple people, right. Then that becomes the, the seeds of that. And I think in those small groups, then that's where you can do the depths. And then you just mentioned it though. So critically is there's a different level of capability in the broader group that if, if we break apart and isolate into just that small group of three, four, five people, and that's not also connected to the collective, then we're never going to actually be able to build. It's like when you get to the end and, and you have these epiphanies, if you can't feed it into something that's has enough collective capability to bring it into existence, you get stuck again. Yeah. And, and th- there is something about that. There's another part there that I, there's a part of trust and the difficulty with trust. I think tracking open loops was part of the discussion before this, at, uh, this discussion of the weaving group of the map, we, uh, mapping group. But then the other part is like, I do trust that it, it, it is an interacting system somehow. If, if awareness is shared, even if it's one, one person in the group, then a lot of things already also shift. That's yeah. also true. So I also wanted to name that part. And we have these kind of, we are all processing it at the same time together. And the more we do this processing and be honest with our systems, what we can handle and what we need really, not just being nice to the group and just trying to give everything, but then after ending up being empty and, and tired because it was such a such yeah. a load of information to process <laughs> yeah, totally. and, and for totally. everyone that's different i think you you've got a Western. like by now you you you've been trained also to handle a lot of information and 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 to meet us there yeah yeah definitely. yeah thank you <laughs> thank you so much and eric you <laughs> yeah. yeah you would not be the first person to say that just individually i'm absolutely um overwhelming and exhausting to be around so i i want to just acknowledge, <laughs> but, uh, acknowledge that okay let's let's come up uh, but I, he's, he's still here and wants to come on video we can we can wrap up here the last couple of minutes <laughs> <laughs> aren't we all though <laughs> <laughs> well, all right well beautiful okay so it's a great Great dialogue today. Um, that was definitely deep. Um, so, uh, so what's next? Um, so, if you if you haven't already, um, let's see. I'm going to do some asynchronous dialogue with Pete on how to um, on how to get the long document that I sent out into a more um, digestible form that people can work with in their own ways of making sense. Um, so Pete, I asked you a question about that on, on Mattermost. Maybe we can dialogue about that. Uh, Google Docs might be a good opening step, and then people can start to parse, summarize, whatever uh, debate. Um, next week is a week for reflection on, you know, so basically in this first cycle, we, we propose these, uh, these five weeks. Next week is a process of reflection and learning before we get into the next iteration. Um, I'm... Uh, I'm intent with whoever is uh, whoever, whoever is willing to go into the next cycle and see if we can do the hard work to keep advancing uh, the structure. And I think a lot of it's going to be. I, th- I think a lot of our collective conversation today is centering around how we create that space with the proper patterning to really let this emergence like burst forward. Um, and so we'll probably spend some time. Um, for the people that are interested in it, we'll probably ask for a small group that's interested in those issues of, of patterning. Um, I agree with who said, whoever said that governance is kind of the wrong word, but um, whatever we want to call that frameworks, we're like trying to learn how we organize ourselves in the best possible way 
Um, and so, so whoever's work interested in that, um, I know Judy's interested in that. I know Pete's interested in that. I know Bill's interested in that. Um, a couple others, uh, Wendy is interested in that. So there's at least five that's the makings of a little group to maybe dive deep on that if, if everybody's interested. Um, and I'm sure there's there's a lot others. So I think um, it would be really interesting to try to bring all those insights together. Um, so next week we'll learn. Um, Marianne, um, you, you just acknowledge that there's like lots of groups doing this. Um, we're trying to be as unredundant as we can in um, the working groups that get spun up and stuff. Um, and we've actually not started a couple working groups because other groups had them emerging. So we want to like celebrate that and share learnings. So I think that would be one of the key things this next two weeks is, is if we're kind of next week to reflect and then we're going to start a new cycle on May 22nd where we're gonna spend the next cycle to really try to nail this patterning and see if we can get it structured to allow this to emerge. I think your, your question is really critical. What other, what other people need to be in the room? What other perspectives need to be in the room? What, what other groups have already tried similar things? What are they learning? How can we connect? Um, and so I just invite all that feedback to come forward. Um, we'll try to kind of learn and synthesize that all next week. Uh, one of the, questions I'm hoping to get guidance on is like specifically who those people are. We can work together to make the appropriate invitations. And then um, and then in the next cycle, we'll, we'll really work on trying to nail down a little bit more of this patterning as best we can to allow for everything that needs to emerge. Um, so yeah, that's, that's I think a little bit, a little bit about that. So what's missing in the last three minutes here? I'm wondering if it might be worth some mechanism to collect people's current wisdom thinking, what, what their learnings are, what their questions are in a very loose and random kind of way. It might help us identify where we already have agreement and where we need more information or more discussion. That was yeah. a talk before this conversation as well, actually. That was a lot of what it was about. As far okay, as great. Let's see, Jonathan and Stacy. Just as um, as a quick response to that, Judy, Jonathan and Stacy have, have both volunteered something as simple as interviews um, that they would they would like to um, be involved in. So, I think if we had a group that was willing to define what those core questions were, or like the topic of that interview in a really wise way, um, we could then have a few different groups, maybe. Um, Jonathan, Sandy, maybe a few others that could could do those either synchronously for the people that wanted to talk or asynchronously. Um, so that would be really interesting. So Stacy and Jonathan and and Judy, maybe maybe we could um, anybody else. Maybe we could work on what that mechanism looks like a little bit. How we how we activate it and just some some really quick feedback loops. I think we've got two opportunities here. One Thanks, is Dave. to have something that's longer term if we're very careful about structuring that question. So a question that we could ask other people outside of this group, if we're doing some sort of local weaving in terms of where we're at. Um, and the interviews would allow us to get a sort of woollier version of where we're at. I think both of them are important. Um, so the, the story capture, you know, using software like SenseMaker and such, this, this is now starting to be important in that if anyone identified um, or we identified other people that we wanted to bring in quickly, it would allow us to have a way of being slightly more, um, mm, structure's the wrong word, categorical's the wrong word, but to get a better shape of what that emergence looks like in a continuity thing. Mm -hmm. If we do the interviews, that will give us the ishness of where we're at now, which will actually help us get the questions. So those two things in parallel, one which is longer term. So then when little boons turn in and on these sovereigns turn up, you'll be able to just roughly work out where they fit. And the interviews will give you the richness of where we're actually at the moment without actually naming the questions that would do 
the first thing in a really rigorous way. So you won't be stepping on the future. And both can be done and neither are particularly hard. They're not hard. Okay, cool. So I have to jump here just a minute. Quick, quick last comments from Pete and Jonathan. Um, uh, I, I love the, the story, uh, interview, storytelling interview idea. And I would also encourage people to blog, um, blog, write a blog post in the Lionsburg town square channel, write a blog on your blog, write blog posts on Twitter or Instagram or whatever. Maybe if we tag them, my meta project story or something like that, um, we can start to collect those and aggregate them, but don't wait. Um, if you've got something to say about what's going on just write it down and it's going to help that's a great idea that's a great idea thanks pete jonathan uh, <clears throat> two things um I, i'd like to define the audience I, we don't have to do that now but it becomes really hard to summarize an interview uh, and do that with the intended audience being the world it's just let's, so let's define the audience for as as ourselves for now as the sounds good as the few dozen people who are who are here and and want to be able to navigate together okay and the second one is um, a process for identifying or for people to volunteer hey i want to be interviewed so. yeah okay Okay, great. So I'm going to ask a question, which is, um, which is, uh, Stacy and Jonathan, you have been the two um, most advocating. Would you guys be willing to kind of coordinate to, uh, together that little circle of energy, um, and then will you let me know, please, what you need and how I can support? Yes, I just need till tomorrow because I'm really feeling sick. Yeah, take oh. your time. Whenever, yeah, we're we're. No hurry, and we're praying for you and here with you and your sickness. Yeah. Um, okay, yes. beautiful. Well, so much love and appreciation as always. Um, and Eric, I just want to acknowledge. Yeah, these these calls are like um, not for the faint of heart with the depths we're going to. So um, I I just want to acknowledge that um, overwhelm and. I think if we didn't go to this depth, it, it, we wouldn't have a chance of succeeding because <laughs> it's like if, if we don't start the right, the DNA right. Um, so I think um, we're going to have to just be patient with each other and heal each other. And get, I, I appreciate you advocating for this room to process. So uh, if anybody else needs some deep processing, ping Eric and set up a call. <laughs> All right. Much love, everybody. Thank you. Looking forward mm -hmm. to uh, next week. See you soon. See you. Bye, all. Thank you. <laughs>